at which we rely on bioimpedance, meaning the edema is already present, the clinician in the examination room relies upon a very simple strategy by physical examination to determine if there's extra fluid in the limb, which is, in essence, can he or she leave a thumbprint by putting a little gentle pressure on the limb? If there's extra fluid there, you can move it around, and that is uh, what we call pitting. That's the, the medical term for it, and you can see the deep pit that the examiner's finger, in this case mine, uh, has left in, in the individual's limb. That should be enough, coupled with the patient's clinical status and a few other features of the examination, to make the diagnosis of lymphedema. But as we've said, the preparedness of the clinicians to assign this diagnosis is still uh, less than exemplary. So sometimes we need some additional objective uh, documentation in the way of testing. So what we've relied on historically and the way we validate the diagnosis of lymphedema is to do a nuclear scan that's called a lymphocytogram. Lymphocytogram simply means that you're using radioactivity to look at the lymph system. This is a lymphocytogram in an individual who has lymphedema in this arm. Let me tell you what we've done. We've taken the radioactivity, which is bound to a large molecule, and injected it into the space between the fingers and you see the large depot of radioactivity in each hand. On the normal side, the lymph ascends quickly to the lymph nodes, which look like black blobs. This is the uh, armpit region, this is the elbow region, and you can see that that material that was injected into the hand and can only get upstream by lymph flow has arrived. On the abnormal side, not only has it not arrived at the same time point, but we also notice that there has been a lot of leakage of lymph. That is, it's taken up in the hand, it's trying to get up to the armpit, but it leaks out into the tissues of the arm because the lymph is under high pressure because it's abnormal. So that is a diagnostic lymphocytogram for lymphedema. Here's another very abnormal lymphocytogram, this one in the legs. And here you see that tremendous evidence of back leakage of lymph. This patient actually has that eyelash problem that I showed you a few moments ago, and it is an attribute of that particular kind of lymphedema to have a lot of back leakage because the valve structures in the lymph system don't work properly. Well, it's a very exciting time because we're actually making some progress in imaging of the lymph system as well, although we can't do it yet in the United States clinically. In Europe and in Asia, they're beginning to use CAT scan and magnetic resonance imaging to look at the lymph system by directly injecting contrast material into these small lymphatic vessels that up until now we really haven't been able to see directly by any x-ray technique. Here's another example of that and we can actually see the major lymph channel in the body called the thoracic duct seen very clearly by having injected some appropriate dye just into a vein in the arm like you would have any other kind of CAT scan or other uh, imaging study. So that's what I can tell you today about diagnosis. Once we diagnose it, what do we do? What's, what is the treatment of lymphedema? First of all, why do we treat it? Because some people ask that question. It's, many doctors think it's not an important problem. It's something to be dismissed. I don't think that's true. I think there are many reasons to treat lymphedema. It poses a risk of infection. It reduces the function of the limb or limbs that are involved. It restricts movement. It really impacts the person's perception of their ability to perform both psychologically and physically in the manner in which they did prior to the development of the problem. And this has been demonstrated readily in any number of ways in formal testing. So what do we do? Well, unfortunately, we cannot restore damaged lymphatic vessels. Not today, anyway. Maybe someday we will. So what we have to do is to augment their function through physical means. I will tell you that the treatment is laborious, it's time consuming, it's on the expensive side in that it requires many hours of a health professional's time, but it is successful in substantially reducing the dysfunction of the limb as the limb comes closer and closer to a normal size. Treatment occurs in two phases. The first phase has to be done by a well-trained physical therapist. 
Part of the problem that we face in the United States is that we have a paucity of such well-trained people and they're not well geographically distributed. Fortunately here uh, on the peninsula and in the greater San Francisco Bay Area, we do have um, a, a suitable number of clinicians who can actually uh, do this. The initial work of the physical, physical therapist involves the repeated application of just this kind of multi-layer bandaging. Now before you get the wrong idea, this is not like a health um, uh, trainer taking an ACE bandage and wrapping it as tight as he can around the limb to squeeze out all the fluid. That's not how it works. This bandage is actually relatively loose fitting, but it has many layers to it, and its job is to augment the flow of lymph, and in fact, when you put on such a bandage and you have a means to measure this, you can show that the lymph vessels, which know how to contract spontaneously and thereby move the fluid out of the limb, these lymph vessels increase both the size of the contraction and the number of contractions per minute that occur when the bandage is in place and the individual is using the muscles under the bandage. That's how it works. So that if we apply this bandage for 12 to 24 hours per session, and perhaps do this 10 or 15 sessions sequentially, we will see a gradual reduction in the size of the limb to the point that we achieve maximal benefit. It is at that point that we can put the care back in the hands of the patient, who then can uh, be given a compression garment that is should be properly fitted and will be worn each day to maintain the benefit that is achieved by those sessions done by the physical therapist. It's important to understand the garment does not make the limb smaller. The garment keeps the limb from getting larger. So we first have to get it smaller through the work of the physical therapist and then maintain that benefit by using the garment. So there is this interlocking uh, approach that includes both healthcare professionals and eventually a self-care regimen, which also includes care of the skin, exercise, and other features that we won't uh, dwell on tonight. Now, it's not a panacea. It will not make the problem go away. And uh, rest assured, I would tell you if it were otherwise, there is no cure for lymphedema. This is a treatment, much like insulin is a treatment for diabetes. And it is not universally effective, but it is largely effective. Here's what I would call an average result. This is an individual with rather severe lymphedema of both legs prior to treatment. And here you see what happens after 10 or 15 sessions of physical therapy and the regular use of a compression garment. These legs are not normal, but you can see they've come down substantially in size. This gentleman can now wear routine slacks. He can put on a pair of shoes and he can go about his life uh, with the garments in place. Now, I do want to point out that lymphedema as a chronic condition is more than fluid. The fluid is problem enough, but actually it has a very complex biology and many things happen when the lymph system is interrupted over a period of time. So one thing that we know happens, and I'm showing you here a CAT scan of a limb. This is the large bone running through the limb. This is the outer perimeter of it, of course. And what you see here that looks like a very thick grapefruit rind is actually the person's skin which has thickened to perhaps five to tenfold its normal thickness under the influence of chronic lymph malfunction. This doesn't happen in any other edema state. This is quite unique to lymphedema. We don't understand the mechanisms well yet. We begin to have some clues, but uh, it's one of the problems that we face. One of the other problems that we face, and this is um, somewhat of a morbid picture, but I think it's important to show you. Um, this is a patient who had breast cancer much earlier in life, 25 years earlier, did not die of that disease, died of something else. But at post-mortem examination, they did a cross-section of both arms. And this is the side where the lymphedema, where the breast cancer was treated. And you'll notice that there has been a roughly tripling of the amount of fat that is present between the muscle and the skin on the side that the lymphedema affected. She was not a svelte woman. She has a fair amount of fat on the other side as well. But I want you to see the disparity. So this woman, by the time she died, did not have a big swollen arm because of fluid. She had a big swollen arm because of fat. 
And that, again, is an inevitable and well-recognized